Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Please stand as we worship our Lord.
for me, for all you've done for us. Boy, we just don't have enough time in the entire world to just think about and praise you for all you've done. But Lord, we praise you as often as we can. We praise you and we praise you. In our dark times when we praise you, they turn to light. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done. Church, please be seated. Now I'm standing here looking a little concerned because we've got supposed to have Nigel Christensen some here today. Um, he's been over in Houston in the United States. Houston, wow. He's been speaking to a bunch of churches there about the same sort of stuff that he's... And I hope he's here. Oh, oh hang on. Oh, no, here he is. Wow. Hello, folks. Yeah, it was a bit... Uh, plane was a bit delayed. Uh, no. Good to see you folks back here today. Welcome to Coast Community Church. For those who've been here before, for those who haven't, you're welcome as well. And in fact, we've got a bit of a notice for you. If you are a first time a visitor or a newcomer to Coast Community Church, we actually have a newcomer's lunch just out in this lounge over here today. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, I didn't register for that, or this is my first time. Don't worry. After you've had your cup of tea or coffee at the end, just feel free to move straight through to the lounge there and you can join us for that newcomer's lunch. We'd love to see you there. Uh, we'd love you to become uh, part of our family here at Coast Community Church. All right, let's just open a prayer and then we'll get underway with a few other things. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings to us. We thank you for this time we have to honour you. And we pray that's our heart's desire today, that this brings glory to you, this service, and is a blessing to those who are watching online or here in person. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now I'm going to call someone up here who many of you will know, his young man and his family, Mr. Carl Orchard. Could I have him come to the front, please? Now, Carl's had a calling placed on his life, um, and so they're going to come and share, us about, share with us about that ministry or calling to the ministry of math. So I would pray that as you listen to them, because I know how challenging it can be to do this, can be quite nerve-wracking, that you would have, that the Holy Spirit would give you uh, ears to hear what he is saying to you personally. That may be different for each person, but really just if you could uh, just have a heart to listen to what they're saying. Now you guys are going to have to come into this middle area a bit more, otherwise they can't see you online, which is very important. Yes, now, where would we do with the microphones? Just down here, there should be one. That's good. So come into this area here a bit more. Come over here, and I'll, I'll let you talk, and then I'll come and pray for you at the end. Can you all hear me? Good morning. Um, we were doing some reminiscing last night. We um, watched some family videos need to be and um, the Beatitudes, so... I recognise some faces who are performers in the Beatitudes, so, yeah, I was very little, I was about four for the Beatitudes, so, yeah, um, Carl and I grew up in Coast Community Church or Rupehu Street Chapel, so it's really awesome coming back to family to speak about this adventure that God's called us on. Carl's just getting the slideshow working. So this is Thea, Thea is four. This is Ayla, Ayla is seven, and I'm Helene, and you probably all knew me as Helene Kelly, but now Helene Orchard, um, and Carl Orchard, and, and I'll pass this to you. This, it should be? Yep. So we just want to spend uh, five, ten minutes just uh, sharing with you about the journey that has brought us to our next um, adventure with our Mission Aviation Fellowship. So I'd like to say that it all started uh, a few years ago. Um, I was born in Wellington, but at two weeks old, I went to mum and dad and said, I think that we're called to uh, mission work over in Papua New Guinea. So by the time I was two months old with my family, we were over there um, for about almost three years um, in Papua New Guinea. So it kind of feels like I'm going full circle back to this country I haven't been to for 30 something years. But in all seriousness, uh, 2008, when I was courting Helene, um, is when I first felt the call from God to a long-term mission trip. We'd done short-term mission trips before, but I felt that God had a plan for me to do, go and do long-term mission trip at some stage. Here we are 15 years later, 15 years married, and it seems God's 
um, steps have taken us now to uh, finally long-term mission as we've been, uh, yeah, you can tell me. Well, so we were, we were courting and Carl told me about this call that he had had from God and he gave me a bit of an ultimatum. So he said to me, if you're not willing to be a missionary and go with me overseas and be obedient to God, then, you know, maybe this relationship won't. <laughs> so it was a bit of an ultimatum, but um, my family and I, we grew up in our rancho. My parents were the chefs there. So for me, being obedient to God and his calling is just being a disciple of Christ. So I was like, of course, if God calls you overseas, I'll go anywhere with you that God calls us. So, yeah. So with that confirmed, we got married. <laughs> and we have uh, been uh, prayerfully wondering when that season is going to happen and um, continuing on waiting for God's timing in that. And um, this is uh, Ayla and Thea, as you've already been introduced to, up at Festival One at the MAF uh, tent there. Um, but something that's resonated with us recently is uh, Proverbs 16, verse 9, which says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. So over those 15 years, I kept thinking, okay, Mission Aviation Fellowship might be part of it. Maybe I should be a pilot. So I'd start down this track of uh, training to be a pilot, do some introductory flights by CAA, um, logbooks and uh, training manuals, and each time God would shut the door on what we were making, thinking was our step into long-term mission and he would open up other doors for me in my career, that looking back now, we can see God's guidance all the way through to this role that I'm looking at um, with him now. I know a lot of you probably, because you support that, uh, some of you support the Hasties, who are also with um, Mission Aviation Fellowship over in Mariba, so there'll be some familiarity in the church with Mission Aviation Fellowship, but I'd just like to share with you a one-minute video for those that may not have heard of it before. We're flying every day into isolated communities where there's no road, there's no infrastructure. We're coming onto the sides of mountains, we're going into the remote bush. We're taking that life wherever we go. We are pilots and engineers. We are IT specialists, we are administrators, we are managers. Together we are Mission Aviation Fellowship. Together we are flying for life. So part of the journey that took us to it, oh sorry, it's changed the slides a little bit on me. Um, this is Murray Kendon and Trevor Strong. For those of you that don't know, Mission Aviation Fellowship is just coming up on 80 years old. Um, Trevor, uh, Murray Kendon was a um, Royal New Zealand Air Force pilot in World War II, and at the end of World War II, he wanted to, uh, thought, I've spent the last few years dropping bombs from these aircraft. I'd love to be able to take the gospel um, to the world using these same types of aircraft. So him and Trevor Strong, both New Zealanders, um, Murray Kendon actually ended up in Lower Hutt, and we've got to meet his uh, wife, who just turned 102 last week. Um, so we're very humble that we're carrying on something that they started. They had the foresight from God 80-odd years ago, and we can continue on that legacy that they've begun. Uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship, we really um, resonate with. As you can see out there, supports over 1,400 organizations, as well as directly bringing the gospel to different areas. It also is kind of the go-between for so many other organizations, allowing them access into places in the world that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Yeah, it's something that we really love about MAF is that um, they support the wider body of Christ. So they are non-denominational as an organization, and they just partner with so many other organizations to help them in their ministry that God has given them. And so it's just really cool how they network all those different parts of the body of Christ. It's actually quite phenomenal when you look at the statistics of uh, what MAF is able to provide now. There, it's 116 aircraft out there, but it's actually up to 130 now. And uh, if you listen to Re Radio Rima or Life FM, you'll hear the, the every seven minutes an MAF plane is either taken off or landing. So it's phenomenal the reach that they have around the world. So I spent 15 years in the Air Force, but I'm not a pilot. So I'm going with MAF, but I'm not a pilot. I'm in, uh, working as the IT manager for the Papua New Guinea operations there, with which I think there's 80 to 100 staff in amongst PNG. So I'll be supporting the IT systems they have there. I've introduced you two already. <laughs> so we'll be in Papua New Guinea, based up in the highlands in a place called Mount Hagen. Uh, I think it's the third largest city in Papua New Guinea. Um, 
blissfully uh, only at a mid-20s temperature. But yeah, that's the main operation space that they have. Um, a lot of the questions we've been getting is, what will I be doing over there? Um, I am a qualified counsellor and they have mentioned that there is a need for that. But I have said for the time being that I see my role as homeschooling the children and supporting Carl as he gets used to the culture and familiar with his role over there. So my role will just be yeah, supporting the family and helping that transition into a new culture and a new environment. Yeah. So like I said, Mount Hagen is where we'll be based, part of the support team there. And this is just a very short video made by one of the pilots based in Mount Hagen of a classic example of them doing essentially the equivalent of a Westpac helicopter rescue. Well, we are here in Singapino, ready for takeoff with three medevac patients on board, two in the back in the cabin, and the little boy which, who is sitting uh, behind me, and he has got a broken leg as well. Three broken bones and a 20 minutes flight to the ambulance, who's, which is waiting already at the airport. We are safely back here in Montague with our three medevac patients. The little boy had uh, some pain on the way because it was really turbulent but now we will offload him and uh, the ambulance is already waiting for him ready to take him to the hospital which is another maybe one hour drive so pilots aren't trained as uh, medical uh, emergency responders as well but often that is the role that they have to take in uh, evacuating injured people in places that would otherwise take them a week or more of walking to the nearest um, um, first aid facility, they're able to take a 30 minute flight thanks to MAF. Um, for us to be able to go over, MAF requires us to raise financial and prayer support. So we are prayerfully hoping that you will prayerfully consider um, supporting us either in prayer or financially as well. There is a goal that we have to reach and we're leaving in July, August at this stage, God willing, if we meet that financial goal. I did update this. We are actually up to 10% now, but there's still plenty of opportunity for you to come and support us. And if you do want to do that, then we've got a desk or table out the back um, by the entrance. Come and talk to us about that. We'll get some, uh, some stickers or some prayer cards that we have as well. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope, hope you'll come and talk to us after. Here we go. I'm just going to pray for the team. Um, sorry? Yeah. Oops, getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Group hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for their willingness to obey your call. I pray that you'd uh, encourage them and bless them as they seek to serve you in a challenging environment. And I just pray your protection over them. And you'd be with them all this way that they'd know you never leave them or forsake them. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, so folks, there will be a table at the back. But there is a table up here I'm going to get my son to help me with. And we're going to shift this in place. And I believe the young people can go out now. Those who are not out already. This around. So what we're putting up here is uh, essentially a demonstration Passover table. So we're going to be looking today at essentially you're going to set those up. That should be good. Messiah in the Passover. Doing that shortly. And I'm putting your thing. You can see I'm putting a few things out on the table. These are these are liquids. It's never a smart plan to move a table with liquids on it unless you don't want them to stay in the bowls that you've put them in. In which case, feel free to move the table with the liquids on it, because it's a good way to spill them everywhere. Especially this. This colour here seems to love white. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> All right, I'm almost there, folks. Thank you for your patience. Okay, yeah, so we're going to be looking at today at Messiah and the Passover, and going through basically a... Uh, I guess, a, a Messiah, a Messianic Passover that's pointing to Christ. You look up here, you see this statement that's been made by Paul, 
For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So what's he saying? He's saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover feast. We're going to be looking at that. Now, if you think about it, the Passover was even ancient in Jesus' day. It had happened almost 1,500, 1,500 years before the time of Christ. So even when Jesus is celebrating the Passover, it's nothing new. <laughs> now we can add another 2,000 years to that. And you remember, of course, that this all happened on the final night of the 10th plague in Exodus. The plague which was to take, the, or, or to bring about the death of all firstborn males of both humans and animals in Egypt who were not protected by the blood of the Lamb. This would become the first of seven feasts that God would put in place for the nation of Israel. And these were like appointments where God was reminding them of all the great things he had done for them as a people. Now this particular feast, Passover, overlaps with another one called Unleavened Bread. You'll get to see some of that later. This was one of three pilgrim feasts, and by that I mean this is one where all adult males in the country who were Israelites would have to go to Jerusalem to attend this feast. So we know that each year growing up, especially as a young adult, Jesus would have gone to Jerusalem. He would have attended this feast. And today we're going to look at the last one. The last one before his crucifixion. The Passover, which the, which the Apostle Paul refers to also as the Lord's Supper. Now, four days before we get to this event of the Passover, which is on the 14th, they had to set aside a lamb or a goat. And it had to meet certain requirements. It couldn't just be whatever they decided. So it had to be without blemish. Couldn't have any fault. It had to be a year old. It had to be a male and a sheep of the sheep or the goat. And then they had to set it aside for four days to observe it before it would be sacrificed. Make sure that it remained without fault. Now, unfortunately, I'm sure that somewhere in that process, some poor, unsuspecting child named that lamb. And lambikins became lamb chops four days later. And we know that's the sad story of the reality of these things. But you see, a sacrifice was required. And sometimes sacrifices can be painful and have a cost. And we're going to look at that cost and its impact on humanity in terms of how it points to Jesus. You see, Jesus himself was set aside. He was presented to the nation four days on exactly the same day, the day we often call Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry. That's the day when he enters into Jerusalem and he's, he's set aside, as it were, as John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He too was also examined to see if he had any fault by four different groups over the, proceed, over the days that followed to see whether they could catch him out. And the outcome was so comprehensive that it said that after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Now I've talked to my Jewish friends and they said that's very unusual for Jewish people to stop asking questions. That's what they told me. And so this was comprehensive. And remember Pilate himself said, I find no fault in this man. Now an event occurs a number of years later after Jesus which changes the entire face of the Jewish culture. And that is the destruction of the temple. And that meant that the sacrifices that were supposed to take place in the temple no longer could be undertaken. There was no priest, there was no temple where they could undertake these sacrifices. And so, why are we doing this today? Well, Paul makes it clear that this is not to be an obligation, but he does point out that this is a shadow and that Christ is the substance. Now, I know I've got an artist over here. Why do we add shadow into a picture, Ariella? What does it give it? Depth, correct. Well done. I didn't tell her what the word was, but she got it exactly right. Well done. Depth. See, shadow doesn't change the nature of the picture, does it? But it gives depth to that same picture. So this is a shadow. Christ is the subset. This is helping, hoping, I'm hopefully helping deepen our understanding who Jesus is, and what he did for us. So then the beginning of the service starts with the lighting of the candles. Now normally this is the 
the lady of the household. For the sake of time, I'm going to just do this myself. Hopefully, I can get this to work. Uh, it's always a flaming nuisance when it doesn't, but there we go. Sorry, a bit of light humour there. But it is, it is appropriate, I think, that we start the service with the lighting of candles. What was the first thing in the creation account? God said, let there be lights. We know that it was through the seed of the woman, normally it would be a woman doing that, that the Messiah came into the world. And he proclaimed himself to be the light of the world, the true light. And what does the light do? You know what one thing it does? It reveals the truth. It reveals the true nature of things. And that's what Jesus did. He came into the world and he revealed our problem. The sin that we had that separated us from God revealed our true need for a saviour and that he would be that saviour that we so desperately needed. So one of the things you may not be aware of, but in a Passover ceremony, there are actually four separate cups. Only two of these are mentioned in the Gospel accounts. But the four cups relate to four I will statements that God makes in the Exodus account. So I want to very briefly look at those and how they relate to us as believers. The first cup of sanctification, big word, just means to be set apart for something specific. And he says, I will bring you out of the bur under the burden of the Egyptians. So Israel was to be set apart from the Egyptian people to be their very own nation, their very own group. And if you think about it, we, now that we're in Christ, have been set apart from this world to be in Christ and he in us. Then there's the cup of plagues, that's the second cup. He says, I will deliver you from slavery to them. It's also called the cup of deliverance. How did that happen? Well, ten plagues were required to deliver uh, Israel out of the nation of Egypt. And you think about the words of Paul where he says that Christ became a curse for us, as it were, he took the curse, the plagues of sin upon himself, that we would be delivered if we accept by grace through faith what he's done for us. Then there's a cup of redemption. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. But redemption just means to buy someone out of slavery and bring them to freedom. You see, the Israelites were in slavery. They weren't just in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt. And so they had to be brought out by a price. What was that price? The blood of a lamb. So too, we're going to look at the, how the blood of a lamb relates to our salvation, the lamb of God. And lastly, the cup of praise or hope. God says, I'll take you to be my people and I will be your God. One of the things that's really interesting to me, if you have a look at the account, is Israel's inability to worship God properly while they were enslaved. It was an ongoing dialogue between Pharaoh and Moses about whether they could go out and do this. Could they worship here? What Maybe some of them here. And so, but they were never able to worship God properly. You know, that's true of us if we don't have a relationship with God. Before we came to faith in Christ, we did not have the ability to worship God properly because we weren't connected to him properly. We were disconnected through sin. It's only through Jesus' death on the cross that he connects us to God in such a way. Now we can worship him as we should. Now we can say, your will be done, Lord, not just my will be done. And so also there's a fifth cup, we'll come back to it later, that's Elijah's cup represented by that silver cup down there. And so the first cup would be poured, I'm just going to represent it here. And it's, it's actually talked about in the gospel accounts. He took the cup and he given it, said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So this first cup is called the Kiddush cup or sanctification. Remember what I said about sanctification means to be set apart. And hopefully, that's what you've done here today. We hope as you've come through that door, you've set apart the worries of life. The things in the business world, the things in whatever part of your life that may be troubling you, we want you to set those aside for a moment and take time for God. Take time to focus on him because guess who has the solution to all those problems? Jesus. Now, he may not have the answer you'd like, but it will be the answer you need. So just remember, when we're coming in here, we're setting apart time for him. And so this is what we've done today. We've come here to bless him and to honor him. And then in the next part of the service is a ceremonial washing. I'm just going to do that very briefly. So there would be usually a bowl like this. You dip your fingers in here and you dry your hands to represent the fact that I'm now preparing to handle the food. 
Do you remember what the disciples were arguing about in Jesus or the Passover room? What were they arguing about? Can you remember? Tell me if you can call it out, you know. Who was the greatest? For you older folk here, you're going to get this. Younger people won't understand this. They have what I would like to call a Muhammad Ali argument as to who's the greatest. All right? Older people will get that. Younger people look at me going, I have no idea what he just said there. But this washing of hands was important because it symbolized ritual cleansing. And in that argument, what was supposed to happen was there was supposed to be a slave at the door to wash their feet as they came in. But not just any slave. The lowest rank slave, the slave of all the other slaves. Because there was like a hierarchy even amongst the slaves. And it was a job no one wanted. You know, people didn't have great shoes in those days. Or roads. So sometimes you could smell people coming. So you imagine trying to wash those feet. That's not going to be, you know, they haven't been to the, you know, had all of their manicured toenails or anything. This is some pretty nasty feet that they're having to deal with. And so no one was willing to do that. No disciple was going to, you know, put aside their pride to wash the disciples' feet. So what did Jesus do? He took the, off his outer garment, takes on the garment of a servant, and he goes around and he washes the disciples. Showing to them the principle. You know, in this world, when you think about the world's principles, horizontal, it's about trying to be better than someone else. You know, the greatest. Who's the greatest? When it comes to our relationship with God, it's not about me being great, it's about God being great. It changes everything. It's not about me first, it's about God first. And Jesus shows this principle. He becomes the slave of all the slaves. And so this was his own statement. If anyone wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all, like one who washes someone else's feet. Also in the account we see there's a dipping of the greens. Now in this Passover, we have a plate. This is a Passover plate here. There are various items that are normally sitting on it. I'm just standing it up so you can see. One of those items will normally be some parsley. And when we get to this point in the service, you normally take the parsley and you dip it into this salted water here. And they will say a blessing, and then they'll eat it. This is the parsley that Jesus referred to when he says uh, about who was going to betray him. He says, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. He was talking about the dipping of the greens into the salted water. So what does this represent? Well, greens speak of life. And the salted water represents suffering and tears. So how does that go together? Well, we're reminded in Scripture that Jesus, through strong crying and tears, through his suffering, what did he bring us? Life. And this also represents the hyssop, which is used to put the blood on the door. Now, of course, we know that Judas would go on to betray Jesus. Unfortunately, he would do so without life or without hope. And now we come to another very powerful image that's found in the Passover. It's the matzotosh and the three matzahs and the breaking of the middle matzah. Now I'm going to do something here. I'm not going to explain it to you. And I'm going to af afterwards, I don't call it out, but afterwards I want you to, we're going to go through it and you're going to explain to me what I just did. I don't think you need to go to seminary for this. In fact, you know, no pressure, but a group of primary school ch children got this. <laughs> So a bit of a worry if you're not getting this, <laughs> unless you're not a believer, in which case, you know, we'll let you off for that one. But I'm going to do something here, and hopefully you see the symbol, what this symbolizes, what this represents. So I have this very special bag here. It's one whole bag, but it's divided into three equal parts. So I have, in essence, a three in one. Three in one. Now, some of you are already underway. Good. Processing that. Now, in this three-in-one, there are three matzahs. And you will always take, every single time, the second of the three-in-one. Every time. Always take the second of the three-in-one. Having taken the second of the three-in-one, you'll break it to two pieces. One piece will go back into this cloth here. And the other one will be wrapped, the broken piece, will be wrapped in a white linen cloth. So I've taken the second of three in one, I've broken it, 
And now having broken it, I'll wrap it. Having wrapped it, I'll then put it away for a time. It'll be hidden away. And then it'll be brought out later to be found with great rejoicing. So let's see how you go. Let's see if you understand what I was talking about. So shout it out together when I go through it. The three in one represents what? The Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the second of the Trinity is always the... So the Son being taken and broken represents what? Jesus yeah, being broken, his, his death. And you notice some of it goes back. So we have the representation of the fact he's fully God, but he's also fully man. Now, the, his, in his humanity, he's able to die. That's the breaking. And what would the wrapping represent? Burial. And then the, the bringing out with great rejoicing? Resurrection. So you didn't need to go to seminary for that, did you? Now, why do I bring this up? Because in millions of Jewish households around the world every year, they do exactly what I've just done, and they do not this is what Paul said in Romans 11 when he says there's a partial hardening. Partial, not some Jewish people still come to faith. And it's not permanent because it's until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. But there's also another passage where he talks about the veil. So folks, please consider your Jewish friends who don't know who Jesus is. They need the gospel just as much as anyone else. And folks, they can't see it. And you might be that person who helps them, by God's grace, to see the truth concerning Jesus as the Messiah. So as I said, that's hidden away. The hiding represents the burial. And what's interesting is this whole account of Exodus that we're talking about, which relates to where the Passover started, was actually foretold centuries before it even happened. God speaking to Abraham said, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. They will be servants there and will be afflicted for 400 years. So this is a minimum 400 years. It's more than that. So this prophecy predates these events by over 400 years. And I'll bring judgment on that nation that they serve and afterward they'll come out with great possessions. Isn't that amazing? Now this was an accident. All of this, the divine sovereignty of God. And in the event, there's usually a set of questions that are asked. One of them, I know, actually would mean that it would predate the destruction of the temple. The last one that's found in the Mishnah about roasting, because they had to change it. Why did they have to change it? Because many Jewish families today don't have roasted lamb anymore. Because there isn't a temple, there isn't a priest. Now, some do. They're a different faction, but many don't. And so they had to change that question about roasted meat, because it may not be appropriate tells you how ancient those questions are. What's interesting is we do have four questions in the Gospel account by four different disciples. Not these questions, but four different disciples are named. And they ask questions. And Jesus does exactly what would be done in a normal Passover. He gives teaching relating to those questions because that would be not what normally happen. We would explain each of the questions. But for the sake of time, we're going to be moving on tonight. This morning, sorry. So then we go to the second couple of plagues. This is also not mentioned, but I bring it out because it does relate to the fact that there were ten plagues that God used, and then that final plague was the night on which these events happened. And so they also re represent the power of God over all of the false gods of Egypt. Some of them worshipped animals, some of them worshipped people, and some of them worshipped demonic spirits. God showed his power over all false gods of Egypt. And then we have the bitter herbs. Now the bitter herbs is part of the prerequisites of a Passover, one of the three things that's required. And it's to represent the suffering of the Israelites during their time in the land of Egypt. And so what they would do is they'll take a piece of matzah, we'll be doing, we'll have a piece of matzah later on. And they take a piece of matzah, they break it, and then they dip it into one of two or both, depending on who you are, two versions of the herbs. Now, for those who are wusses, I mean are wise, 
sorry, those who are wise, they would dip it into horoset. That's meant, meant to represent the, the mortar, because that's just apple and cinnamon and honey. Those who are brave, they will dip it in, or foolish, whatever you want to call them, uh, they'll dip it into the horseradish, and that's supposed to bring tears to your eyes. Now what's interesting is that this, this bit of herb, this, and, and the, the use of the, the matzah and the bitter herbs, is also mentioned in Jesus' account, because he makes what he calls the morsel. And the morsel would have been when you take two pieces of matzah and make like a sandwich, and possibly there would have been other things there as well, but you make like a sandwich that he would give to Judas. What you may not be aware of is in traditions, some people believe that the giving of the morsel was what the celebrant, so that would be someone like myself, did for the honoured guest. So think about what's happening here. And what's going to happen soon? Jesus is taking this and he's giving it to Judas, showing him to be the honoured guest. A last, as it were, show of grace by Jesus to Judas. A last chance, as it were. Don't do what you're going to do. Stay. Be the honoured guest. And it's interesting because in the account uh, it says, well, Jesus says, it is to he whom I give this morsel of bread. So there's the bread when I've dipped it. So we see that's what he's talking about there. And so when he dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Iscariot. Be the honored guest, Judas. What happens? Well, unfortunately, Judas makes, sadly makes the wrong decision. He makes a decision from which there will be no return. And it says, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Wow. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. John's account also adds, and he went out and it was dark, it was night. Now you don't have to tell anyone that. Passover is always at night. Why is he saying that? Remember what I said earlier? Jesus is the light of the world. Judas was rejecting that light and going out into darkness. Never to return. What a sad picture of unbelief. What a sad picture of a lost person not willing to accept the truth concerning who Jesus really is. And of course we would place that then at the beginning of the meal. The, the disciples think he's, he's got the money purse. They think maybe he's been sent out on an errand or something. And then we would come into the meal itself. And of course in the meal, this is where they would have the lamb. And something I just learnt recently was about how long it takes to cook a lamb. Now, Passover starts at twilight, which is about 3 o'clock. Unleavened bread would start at sunset, because that's when the day starts, the Jewish thinking. So we've got four hours. Guess how long it takes to cook a lamb approximately roasted? Four hours. <laughs> yeah, it all works in. And so they would have eaten this lamb. And of course, not a bone of the body was to be broken. And this is fulfilled in Jesus' death on the cross, where he's already dead when they come to break the body, so they don't. They don't break a bone. What do they do instead? The spear in his side. And in doing that, they fulfill a second prophecy. So firstly, not a bone is broken, fulfills one prophecy. And in response to that, fulfills a second. He'd be pierced. And that's the word in Isaiah, is talking like pierced with a spear. Isn't it interesting? John is blown away. That's why he's recording it in his account. He's like seeing the word of God being fulfilled right before his eyes. On the cross, Jesus is dead. And yet still, God's word is being fulfilled. I think his mind was blown. God knew what he was doing. This was no accident. So I just want to also now take a moment before we come into communion just to share about what God's been doing in the trip that I had to Houston. I'm very grateful for those who made this possible. Um, my wife and I attended a conference last year in Jerusalem. And in that conference I went to a workshop and basically that workshop resulted and the Lord providing in such a way that I was able to be in Houston about some seven to months, eight months later. That's just, most, one of the guys who worked for chosen people said that doesn't happen. <laughs> so that's God. God was doing it. He made it possible. So he made it possible for, uh, as I say, like to call myself now, the Wild Branch, <laughs> that's on Romans eleven seventeen, and a bit of a joke, uh, to go to the Wild West where I encountered some interesting creatures there. Uh, in the local museums. 
So what did I do there? Well, I had the opportunity to present Passover, just like this. Imagine that. Out of 200 people in one service, about 150 to 170 said they'd never done a Passover before. I was blown away. There's a need there, folks. That's why God seemed to want me to go there. So I went to the Texas Cowboy Church. Yes, they wear cowboy hats. And amongst other things, I went to various churches, and it was amazing. I had a great time, and the Lord was very gracious. And so I'm very thankful for the support I had to get me there. And so that was, uh, obviously, we may not be aware, but there's preparation on the way to go back next year, Lord willing. It's already happening. Uh, booking, a booking has already come in. So thanks to God's grace, it looks like we're going ahead, Lord willing, again next year. So if that's something, if you're not already signed up with the ministry updates that I give out, and you're thinking, hey, that's interesting, I'd like to know more, then we do value a prayer. We do need prayer. So if you'd like to be part of our prayer team, then you come and talk to me afterwards or just email me. Just go into the church directory and send me an email from there. All right. So let's return now. 2,000 years of time. We're going to go to the Afikoman. The Afikoman. So, Ariella, you want to come up? There's my keyword for my helpers. Afikoman. Yes. Come on up, Ariella. All right. So now, Ariella, you're going to try and find the hidden Afikoman that looks like this. It's not this one, so you can't cheat. I'm going to just give you a clue. It's somewhere on the stage, but it's um, not hidden in such a way you can't find it. So you have a look around. You, you see if you can find it. No, that's cold. It's cold. getting warmer. It's warmer. Yep, getting very warm, very warm. Getting very, no, now you're getting colder. No, no, it's colder. Warmer. Warm, uh, almost boiling. Going to be burning. Oh, there it is. All right, good. Thank you. Well done. Yes, give her a hand. Now, before you go, Ariella, I know you know this is very rare and unusual, but I'm going to open my wallet. Oh, the dust. <laughs> Been a while. And I'm going to give you a reward, so well done. <laughs> That'll help pay for a student fees. No. <laughs> She's looking for a job. Any, actually, anyone want to hire a... No. But no, thank you, Ariella. That's very kind of you. So we bring out the Afik home. So think about when this is happening. Now, coming around to you now, so just hold on to it for a second, is Matzah. And I want you to have a look at it when you get it. Okay? So have a look. So think about when this was happening in the Passover. At the exact same time as in a modern Passover, they take and unwrap the second of the three in one that was hidden away, broken, hidden away, and they bring it out. They take at the exact same time as Jesus said, this is my body, this is when they take bread and eat it. Now think about that. Have a look, excuse me, <coughs> have a look at it. Hold it up to the light. <coughs> Apologies. Have a look at it, hold it up to the light. You'll see holes. It's pierced, and that's no accident. It happens every time. Also, see, you might not be able to see it so clearly, but on a bigger piece, you notice it's also striped, and it's also unleavened. So we have three things to think about here. Leaven in the Bible represents sin. So if something is unleavened, it means it's without sin, sinless. Secondly, it's always pierced to stop it from, from puffing up. Okay? Puffing up could represent pride, but it also main, means it stays flat. Okay? And finally, it's striped, and that's because they have it on a high heat to get rid of any moisture. Also, again, to stop it from expanding in any way. So every time you get a piece of matzah, it should always be pierced and striped and unleavened. And think about that. That's Jesus' body that he takes and he breaks. And he says, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. He, the sinless Son of God, was pierced for our transgressions. By his chastisement we have peace, and through his stripes we are healed. As you take that bread today, I want you to consider that Jesus, the bread of life, died so that you might live, have everlasting life. Let's take that bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you as we take this bread that this points to you, who you are, and what you've done for us. The cup of redemption. This connects to the I will statement that God makes. He says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm.
So at exactly the same time in a Passover today, when the Passover celebrant, having just handed out the afikomen and taken the bread, he would then turn with the meal having concluded and take the cup, as it says in the Gospel accounts, after supper. Exactly the same time, this is when they take what they call the third cup of redemption. And this is what Jesus says, drink of it all of you. For this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now think about the original exodus. Blood was required for redemption to occur. The blood of an innocent lamb had to be shed so that those within the household who might otherwise suffer the wrath of God would be spared. As we take this cup today, we can remember the price that he willingly paid for us to redeem us. Remember, redemption is to buy out of slavery into freedom. He redeemed us. And so we can be thankful that our Messiah was willing to pay that price to shed his blood on a cross so that we might be brought into God's family. Let's pray for the cup. Father God, we thank you for your son who was willing to to die on that cross. We thank you that he was willing to shed his blood for us. As we take this, help us to consider the cost that he suffered that we might go free, free from the wrath of God, just as those in Egypt were protected, that we too are protected in Christ because of what he's done for us. We thank you for this, Lord, as we take this cup today. Now something, as this is we're just concluding this section, that I need you to be aware of is that they don't normally ever make any direct reference to the blood in any normal Haggadah. Think about that. A standard Jewish Haggadah will never usually directly reference the blood. That's the most important thing. <laughs> and you think, now why would they do that? The closest they tend to get was the greens I talked about earlier, and that represents the hyssop. That's about as close as they get. So why would they overlook the blood? I'm going to show you something, and maybe it might give you an idea. Because some kids, you know, they ask awkward questions. We've got one of those in our family. <laughs> Who will remain nameless. But they ask lots of interesting questions, but also some awkward ones. So have a think about this. They were told to capture the blood in a bowl. Some of you may not be aware, but the word for bowl in Hebrew is exactly the same as threshold. They're the same word. You can change them. You have a look. Go and have a look. When it says threshold, it can also mean bowl, especially in the Exodus account. So this tells us where they captured the blood. Now, some people think they might have hollowed out uh, a space in the threshold to capture the blood. Maybe. But it tells us where, and it makes sense. You wouldn't carry sloshing blood around, would you? Just like I took all of the liquid off here before I moved it. Okay? So where you're going to dip and strike the blood, that's where you're going to kill the animal. Makes a lot of sense. And then they were to take the blood and they were to strike it with the hyssop. The hyssop was like the, like almost like a big paintbrush. And they strike it on one side, the other side, and then in the lintel over the top. What do you see there? Anyone see anything? Say it a bit louder. Cross. Awkward question time, isn't it? If you're in a Jewish household. And your kid goes, hey, that looks like a cross of blood. Whew. If they're not believers, that's an awkward question or statement. Okay? Maybe that's why they don't. I don't know, but it's just a thought. See what Paul, Peter has to say. He says, knowing that you're ransomed from your futile ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. What does he compare it to? Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Guess what lamb he's talking about? Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, Moses was told that this blood was to be a sign for the nation of Israel. Recently I was in Houston and I had to drive 
with different road signs. Now, good signs, I can tell what they say without anybody needing to explain them to me, right? That's what a good sign does. It gives a clear, important message in an instant, and I understand, ah, this is, this is what I need to understand. Here's the sign. The blood of an innocent lamb had to be shed to bring redemption and to cover those under judgment from the wrath of God. Pretty cool sign, right? And that's exactly what it speaks of. And it's also interesting that they consider this event to be a memorial. They, they look back, but they also look forward. And looking forward, they, they expect the return of Elijah. That's why I've got a special cup down there, cup of Elijah. That's the fifth I will statement, actually, going back to the Exodus account. But sadly, they missed the point that in Malachi, when it talks about Elijah, earlier, it had also talked about one who would come to prepare the way of the Lord. Who is that? John the Baptist, first coming. Elijah's going to be related to the second coming. So they think he hasn't come, but he has. But interestingly, we also look back and look forward. Think about it. We look back at his death on the cross, but we do this until he comes. So we too look forward and look back. We're just about finished this, um, this Passover, Messianic Passover, and I just want to conclude with a thought about the fourth cup. Jesus, as far as I'm aware, had already stated that he would not drink again of the fruit of the vine at this point. And so I want to make a, a possibility here. I can't prove this, but it's possible that Jesus did not drink the fourth cup because the others sort of place it after the third cup. That statement, I won't drink. But if he didn't drink a physical cup, what's interesting, I think he did drink a spiritual cup. One that he drank alone. No one else could take. And that cup was the cup of God's wrath. Remember he says in the garden, you know, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And in scripture, a full cup, this isn't a full cup, but if you imagine it was, can represent two opposite things. In Psalm 23, the full cup is a cup of joy and blessing. But in Revelation, it's a cup of God's wrath. So how does that work? Well, Jesus took the cup that he alone could take, the cup of God's wrath, so that we might experience and partake of the cup of God's blessing. So hopefully you have that relationship with Jesus. He is your saviour. Think back to the Exodus account. It was not good enough for your neighbours to do it and you just go, oh, that's nice, they've got blood on their door. It has to be on your door. Same too with our faith in Christ. Your parents can't save you. Coming to church can't save you. You need to have that personal relationship with Jesus yourself. He needs to be your saviour. And I pray that he is. And so the service concludes with singing. So I'm just going to clear a space here for the musicians and ask them to come up. And at the end of the service, Michael, do you want to give me a hand with this to put these uh, candles out? At the end of the service, there's a saying they have, which is basically a, an expression of hope. And the expression of hope is basically, in Hebrew, Lishana Haba'a Yerushalayim, which translated means, next year in Jerusalem. So let's see if we can say that all together. Remember? Next year in Jerusalem. So I want to end with a statement by Jesus. Because we also should have hope. Jesus says, at the end of Revelation, he says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
Oh
Passover and how he was written about years before he came to earth. He is the Messiah. Lord Jesus is God. I just can't imagine the day when the Father says, I've got this great idea, we're going to create a physical universe, but boy, it's going to hurt you, Lord Jesus. It's going to hurt you, my son. And Jesus says, I'll do it, Father. I'll go to earth and I'll pay that price for the people you're creating, for the people he knew us before he laid the foundations of the earth. Isn't that an amazing God? So church, is it well with your soul? Is it? It cannot be unless you have submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you can think of a time when you've said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I turn away from those things. I know you are the Lord and I accept you and please walk in my life. If you said that prayer before or something like it, or if you've said it now, you are saved. And it can be well with your soul. Thank you. And Nigel, thank you so much for your um, blessing to us today. And the message, it was awesome. I'm going to watch it again to catch the bits I missed. Um, and it's <laughs> what a privilege to have our speaker and facilitator singing beautifully from the front to us as well. So thank you. Church, I don't want to finish the service, but I'm afraid it is. So stay, um, have a um, fellowship with us. And as Nigel said, we've got the newcomers lunch next door. Thank you. God bless you all.